We would like to welcome all of those that are joining us for the Clarence Dixon Taylor lecture today. Uh, my name is Jay Buckley. I'm the director of the Charles Red Center for Western Studies. And today's speaker will be Tom Alexander, a former director of the Charles Red Center. We will have a word of prayer offered by our office specialist, Amy Carlin. Then I will briefly introduce um, Charles Dixon Taylor and announce the Charles Dixon Taylor Award winners for the last two years. And then Brendan Renzink, the Associate Director of the Charles Red Center will uh, introduce our speaker today. Clarence Dixon Taylor, um, formerly or fondly known as Uncle Bud to his family, um, died in 2005. Uh, he was born in 1909 and lived a rich and full life. Um, back then, Provo had no paved roads in the city. The largest employer was the Provo Woolen Mills. Um, he was the sixth of eight children of Arthur Taylor and Marion Dixon. And his mother's family uh, had a rich tradition from joining the church in South Africa in the 1850s. And when um, Clarence received his mission call. It was originally to England, and his mother went and spoke with church president Her um, Heber J. Grant and explained that there must be some mistake. Her son should have been going to South Africa. And I'm not sure how it happened, but he received a new call and was sent to South Africa. Um, he was very involved in preserving his family history and records. I published several books, including My Folk, The Dixons. Uh, he worked in a furniture business, the Dixon Taylor Russell Company, as well as the BYU Bookstore. He was a veteran of World War II, served in the European theater, was at Utah Beach, um, and also in Germany, and just lived a, a rich and full life that was very devoted to building up the community. This award created by the Dixon and Taylor families um, emphasizes or recognizes outstanding scholarship in central Utah, including Utah, Carbon, and Wasatch counties. Uh, because of COVID last year, we weren't able to announce the 2019 award winners in person, but um, we want to share those with you now. Ronald G. Watt wrote a book entitled My Life in Carbon County in the 1950s, which was the first place award winner. Charlene Winters, a city of Orem, a centennial benchmark. Orem commemorated its 100 year anniversary last year, also received an award. And Ryan Lee from the Harold B. Lee Library exhibit on Golden Spike, 150 years of the Utah Railroad history uh, was another award winner. We're pleased to announce the winners of 2020, uh, which is, um, the Pioneer Magazine of the Sons of the Utah Pioneers with the, um, under the advising um, of Bill Tanner, who was the directing editor. And these are some of the articles and um, authors that are featured in volume two and volume three of last year's uh, Pioneer publication. So we want to commend and congratulate um, our 2019 and 2020 awardees. And now I'll turn the time over to Brendan Renzink, who will introduce today's speaker. Uh, thank you, Jay. I'm very excited to introduce our speaker today, Thomas G. Alexander. I have known him for as long as I've been here at the Red Center, and he's always a welcome presence when, we, when we're able to have him here in person. Um, Dr. Alexander is Professor Emeritus of History from here at Brigham Young University, where he held the Lemuel Hardison Red Jr. Professorship in Western American History. And uh, notably, he was also, he's also one of the former directors of the Red Center. He has served not just here at the Red Center uh, and in the History Department here, but uh, in many uh, professional historical organizations as president and in innumerable other positions. He's received lifetime achievement and awards and awards of merit from many of them as well. Um, this may not be uh, of note, but I've always found it amusing and I've always appreciated that he serves as the official parliamentarian of the Western History Association. So 
when we have business meetings and things at the Western History Association, Tom is always there uh, cracking that whip and making sure that we're following all the rules of conduct in our meetings, which is always, it's always fun seeing everyone turn to Tom and say, Tom, did we do this right? And, you know, he makes sure, he makes sure that we do. Um, as a historian, uh, Tom has published extensively on the North American West, um, Utah history, Mormonism, and the environment. Some of his uh, notable titles include Mormonism and Transition, a History of the Latter-day Saints, 1890 to 1930. Um, I will note that within the last month or so, I saw some people talking online about um, how they picked this book up and they're saying, I can't believe this was written in the 1980s and it still uh, is so, uh, it still holds water. It's still so good. And they, there was this discussion going on about how people were still returning to it. So not, not all books written in the 80s can say that. Um, uh, he also wrote um, a biography of Wilford Woodruff entitled Things in Heaven and Earth, The Life and Times of Wilford Woodruff, a Mormon prophet. He was the author of Utah, The Right Place, which was the official centennial history uh, written for the state of Utah. And most recently, um, and from which he'll be pulling some of his uh, lecture today, he uh, wrote uh, the biography Brigham Young and the Expansion of the Mormon Faith. I'm very grateful that Tom agreed to postpone this for a year and to return uh, and speak with us. So um, join me in welcoming Tom Alexander. To understand why Brigham Young ordered the evacuation of Provo, of members living in Salt Lake City and towns, uh, evacuation to Provo, I should say, of uh, members living in Salt Lake City and cities and towns to the north, uh, we must understand Young's fear that armies would inflict death and destruction upon the Latter-day Saints. His knowledge and fear of such dangers had developed during his experiences with armed anti-Mormons in Ohio, Missouri, and Illinois. Uh, pursued by Joseph Smith's opponents, some of them armed, uh, Brigham Young had fled from Kirtland, Ohio in late December, 1837. After reaching Missouri, he established a small farm eight miles northwest of far west. Young remained with his family and did not join the Mormon militia in the Mormon-Missouri War of 1838. Though he was a non-combatant, he, his family, and most of the saints suffered during the war's aftermath because Missouri's authorities had imprisoned Joseph and Hiram Smith and Sidney Rigdon of the First Presidency. Brigham Young, as a senior member of the Quorum of Twelve Apostles carried the major responsibility of assisting the body of the saints to evacuate. Goaded by Governor Lilburn W. Boggs's order to exterminate the saints or drive them from Missouri and suffering from the confiscation of property and food by the Missouri Army, young organized refugee companies and led them uh, from Western Missouri to Western Illinois. Short of food and clothing and transportation, Young, his family, and the saints suffered unbelievable hardship and agony during the winter of 1838-39 as they struggled across Missouri's frozen lands. His wife, Marianne Angel Young, had the agonizing task of fleeing with their children and the body of the saints, as in her words, their footprints not unfrequently marked with blood upon the snow and ice. After the murder of Joseph and Hiram Smith by militiamen in Carthage jail in June 1844, the saints hung on precariously in and around Nauvoo until early 1846. Then violent attacks forced the Mormons to evacuate Missouri, Illinois. Young had left early in 1846 following attacks on settlements outside Nauvoo while traveling uh, with the saints in Iowa, however, 
Young learned of the plight of poor saints in Nauvoo who did not have the means to pack up and leave. He sent teams and wagons back to retrieve them. These saints sought to leave Nauvoo under fire from well-armed independent militiamen led by Thomas S. Broxman. The saints received virtually no protection from Illinois Governor Thomas Ford, but Daniel H. Wells, at the time a non-Mormon who later joined the church, led the saints in their failed effort uh, to protect the, the uh, Mormons, the poor ones, as they resisted, surrendered, and evacuated. The saints began to immigrate to Utah in 1847, and in 1850, Congress organized Utah Territory with Brigham Young as governor. By the mid-1850s, however, a number of federal officials had sent letters to Washington charging the Mormons with treason, murder, and other serious offenses. Instead of investigating the charges, after his inauguration in March of 1858, President Bu or 1857, President James Buchanan removed Brigham Young as governor and sent an army of 2,500 men to escort Alfred Cumming as governor together with a new set of executive and judicial appointees. Buchanan did not notify Brigham Young of his removal or of the dispatch of the army, but in May, 1857, Young learned that the United States Army had mustered at Fort Le Leavenworth, Kansas, and that they were preparing to move across the plains against Utah. Consulting with territorial leaders, Young ordered militia commander, Lieutenant General Daniel H. Wells, to dispatch units to the High Plains to slow down the army by burning their supply trains. The Legion, the Nauvoo Legion, also stationed militiamen in Echo Canyon to fight the army should they try to reach the Wasatch Front by that route. Unable to, uh, to reach the Wasatch Front before the winter of 1857-58, the U.S. Army, under the command of Bre Brevet Brigadier General Albert Sidney Johnston, burrowed down in winter camp with the federal officials at Camp Scott, a temporary post near the abandoned Latter-day Saint forts of Bridger and Supply in what was then Utah, territory and later in Wyoming. Some poorly informed people have argued that the army posed no threat to the Latter-day Saints. The soldiers, they have said, were United States troops, not state or independent militia. It's clear, however, because of the attitudes of a number of the army's officers, the U.S. troops intended to kill Mormons. Although General Johnston urged the soldiers to behave themselves, a number of other officers looked forward to killing the Latter-day Saints. Captain Randolph B. Marcy wrote, they deserve to be annihilated. Johnston's adjutant, Major Fitzjohn Porter, said that the army should exterminate the Mormons. They deserve no mercy at the hands of the government. Brigham Young understood that they could not hold off the army in an extended fight, and he expected that the soldiers would siege the Latter-day Saints settlements. In order to save the saints from extermination, he decided to follow the example of the Russian evacuation of Sevastopol, often called Sebastopol, during the Korea, uh, Crema, Crimean War of 1854-55, Russia on one side and France and Britain on the other. The Russians found themselves 
in an indefensible position on the Crimean Peninsula city of Sevastopol. In September 1855, the Russians decided to evacuate the city to save their army from destruction. Instead of pursuing the Russians, the French just occupied the city. Referring directly to the Russian example in a sermon on March 21st, 1858, Brigham Young said the saints would evacuate Salt Lake City and the settlements to the north. He said they may have Sevastopol after it's evacu evacuated, but they cannot have it before. You may ask whether I am willing to burn up my houses. Yes, and to be the first man that will put, put the torch to my dwellings. If we are obliged to remove cash and lay waste, it is for our good. It is not for our injury. Our enemies are determined to blot us out of existence if they can, but we, we shall have, we shall leave our buildings and they will possess them. And I am in favor of leaving them before I am obliged to. We want 500 families to go south forthwith and be ready to raise corn, potatoes, squashes, beans, and so forth this season. I would rather see this city in ashes than lose one good elder. Agreeing with our, her husband, Mary Ann Young said, I am in favor of leaving here without fighting. I would be sorry to see that one good brother had lost his life defending my home. I would rather leave peaceably. We shall be innocent and God will bless us with his Holy Spirit and we shall be happy in the desert. She said desert because Brigham had at first expected the saints might move to the desert near the White Mountains then in Utah. Young sent an exploring party under the leadership of Parowan State President William H. Dame to try to find a place for the Latter-day Saints settlement in what is now central Nevada. Dame's party reached the area and actually planted a few crops, but their exploration proved that the area had insufficient land and water to permit the large number of Latter-day Saint refugees to establish farms and homes there. In search of their options, Brigham Young also listened to the pr proposal of some promoters who offered to sell the Latter-day Saints a large area of the M Mosquito Coast of Nebraska for their, excuse me, of Nicaragua for, for a settlement. Some people expected that the United States might annex that region. In fact, Young never seriously considered that offer. Until news of a tragedy reached Salt Lake City on March 8, 1858, the possibility existed that the Saints might be able to travel north to Fort Limhi in what was then Oregon Territory and is now in Idaho. Word came in, however, that a band of Bannocks had raided Fort Limhi settlement, killing and injuring some Mormons. The attack, which some of the army's contractors encouraged, forced the settlers at Fort Limhi to evacuate and return to Utah. By April 3rd, settlers from Fort Limhi had begun arriving in Salt Lake City. To facilitate the evacuation and burning of Salt Lake City, on March 25th, the saints began to dismantle some buildings and prepare to torch others. Reports indicated they continued this task at least through March 30th of 1858. Workers disassembled and cached the quartz monzonite stones that we generally call granite that masons had begun to lay on the Salt Lake Temple grounds. The workers covered the foundation with dirt to make it appear like a field ready for planting. Workers removed the windows and organ pipes from the old Temple Square Tabernacle. They stored some of the windows, transported others to Provo, 
they sent the tabernacle organ to Provo as well. The members themselves wasted no time before beginning to pack for the move to Provo. On March 22nd, the day after young Sevastopol uh, sermon, Richard Bentley began loading books and papers in the church historian's office for transport to Utah County. On March 24th, freighters with loads of books and documents from the historian's office began driving their wagons south. These stacks included a large number of books, including a copy of the Hawaiian Book of Mormon, a president from George, uh, a present from George Cannon, who helped to translate it. James Ivey drove wagons pulled by mule teams loaded with historians office boxes bound for Provo on March 30th and April 2nd. On April 2nd, as Ivy took loads to Provo, a paper blew out of one of his wagons and scared his mules. Panicked by the paper, the mules bolted and tipped over wagon, uh, Ivy's wagon. The upside wagon spilled one of the boxes on the ground, breaking it and severely injuring Ivy. The freighters temporarily deposited records and four desks called secretaries from the church historian's office in the Provo Music Hall. Workers later moved the records and desk to a more satisfactory location in the Provo Seminary building. On April 2nd, church historian George A. Smith arrived in Provo, drove to the music hall where he took stock of the documents and books. On April 1st, the saints began what became an extended effort to supply food for those saints who had evacuated from Northern Utah to Provo. This included some cases, transporting food from Salt Lake and in others, planting crops as Young had requested in his sermon announcing the Sebastopol plan. On April 1st, Thomas Roylitz dispatched five wooden boxes of flour from Salt Lake to Provo. On April 21st, Wilford Woodruff took 47 bushels of wheat to a mill on the Jordan River where he had them ground into flour. On April 22nd, with the help of Robert Campbell and Richard Bentley, Woodruff took a wagon loaded with three tons of flour to Provo, which they unloaded and stored the next day. As late as June 11, orders from Salt Lake City to uh, Provo Bishop Elias Blackburn to send all the Provo teams possible to Salt Lake City to transport the rest of the church's tithing flower uh, to Provo. Ivy's wagon was, the, was not the only one that met disaster. On April 22nd, those unloading wagons in Provo found that a number of the bins of wheat taken to Provo tithing office had burst and spilled in the wagons. Teamsters had to unload and repack the wheat. Instead of relying entirely on food shipped from Salt Lake, some of the settlers planted crops and cared for animals in Provo and at other places, as Brigham Young had recommended. On April 8th, Wilford Woodruff dragged and planted about two acres of ground in Provo into sugarcane and corn. On April 20th, he loaded some choice budded peaches, apricots, grapes, and other plants in Brother Charles W. Wandel's uh, carriage for transport to, pe to Beaver. Woodruff apparently intended either that he or Wandel would plant them to produce fruit and beaver for the settlers who had moved south. George A. Smith planted a garden in Provo and he built a sty for his pigs and pens for his sheep there. He also searched for places to store his goods and decided to put some in his house, some in sheep pens and some out of doors. Planning for crops and providing feed 
to clothe the refugees in Utah County from Northern Utah, occupied some of the time of the church leaders. On May 21st, 1858, Brigham Young, Heber C. Kimball, George A. Smith, John Taylor, Albert Carrington, Utah County State President James C. Snow, and Provo Bishop Elias Blackburn met with leaders in Spanish Fork and Springville uh, to discuss planting, planting crops in the two cities to help supply food for those who were moving south. They noted that Spanish Fork settlers were in the process of planting corn, a task they expected to finish the following week. The leaders also visited a water power mill near Springville to which John Taylor was attaching a carding machine that he apparently planned to use to card wool that the settlers could spin into thread and weave into cloth to make clothes for the newly arrived saints. Transporting from the north and planting and weaving in uh, Utah County did not provide all of the things that those who moved south needed. To help fill the need on May 10th, David Beasley brought a load of goods from California to sell to the settlers. He set up a temporary store in what was then called Battle Creek, now Pleasant Grove, from which he sold uh, the goods to church members who had moved uh, to Utah County. Following Brigham Young's instructions, members of the First Presidency and Quorum of the Twelve, as well as lay members, moved their families and goods from Salt Lake City and points north to Provo. On April 1st, uh, Presidents Young, Heber C. Kimball, and Daniel H. Wells of the First Presidency, and George A. Smith, Ezra T. Benson, and John Taylor of the Twelve, began to evacuate their families to Provo under extremely adverse conditions. As teams pulled their wagons through Salt Lake and Utah counties, heavy windstorms made the roads and even the teams pulling the wagons impossible to see. On the windswept road at the time, an estimated 100 Latter-day Saints families with their wagons and, tree and teams drove toward Utah County. Some of the, teach, the church leaders could not reach Provo in the windstorm. They remained in what was then called Lake City, now American Fork overnight. After sleeping in American Fork on April second, a number of church leaders arrived in Provo. Utah State President James C. Snow and Bishops Elias H. Blackburn of Provo and Warren S. Snow of Manti found temporary places for them to stay. Brigham Young put his family in the Huffaker family's house and he stored his goods in the music hall with the historian's office papers. Heber C. Kimball installed his family in Isaac Bullock's Redfield Hotel. Daniel H. Wells found a place for his family in the Bouvier family's house. After settling their families in Provo, members of the First Pre Presidency returned to, to American Fork, where they remained overnight before traveling back to Salt Lake City. Other Latter-day Saint leaders and lay members prepared on April 2nd and afterward to move their families to Provo. Uh, these included uh, some of the families of Wilford Woodruff, Robert L. Campbell, and Richard Bentley. On April 5th, William Somerville took w Woodruff's plural wives, Sarah and Emma, and their children and things to Provo. In addition to windstorms, some of the moves took place in the worst snowstorm of the entire winter. On April 7th, Woodruff spent the day loading three wagons. On April 8th, Woodruff, who tried to take a, road, a load to Provo, found the road impassable. He nearly froze his hands and he became so chilled I could hardly move, he wrote. When he reached Unionville in central Salt Lake County, he found the road lined with people and teams to Provo for 50 miles. Many of the saints came near perishing, Horses died by the wayside. 
unable to travel because of the snowstorm, the saints unloaded their goods in the mud. Others unhitched their teams and left their wagons sticking in the mud. Some teams gave out and whole families lay in the mud under their wagons overnight. Women carried children in their arms, waded in the water and mud and snow knee deep. Since he could not push on to Provo, Woodruff stopped in Unionville and spent the night with Abraham O. Smoot's sister, Marticia Smith. Finding the road still impassable, Woodruff remained at Smith's the next day, still unable to go on because of the snow and mud. On April 10th, he unloaded two of his wagons, left a third one at Marticia's home in Union and returned with two wagons and teams to Salt Lake City. Dust storms again made travel extremely difficult later in the spring. On May 19th, Wood tra Woodruff traveled to Provo with three teams. He said the dust, sand, and gravel filled the air and filled my face with it until I could not see at all and it was difficult to keep the road. He remained the next day, May 20th, on the Provo bench the current city of Orem in a persistent dust storm, and he did not arrive in Provo to unload his wagons until the next day. After the difficulties with snowstorms and impassable roads on, May, on April 8th to 10th, Woodruff waited until the next week to work at moving again. Two of his wives, Sarah and Emma, had already moved to Provo, but he still had to move more of, his, of the supplies of his own and of the church historian's office. From April 13th through 17th, he spent the week in moving supplies, including desks uh, from the historian's office to Provo. On the 17th, he had to drive back from Provo 50 miles through a hard rainstorm. On April 19th, he spent the day in preparing to move three loads to Provo. After reaching Provo on April 23rd, he met with George A. Smith, Heber C. Kimball, and Brigham Young at the seminary building where Young had set up his office. Uh, in the meantime, the move south had continued. On April 12th, Jesse M. Smith arrived in Salt Lake City from Parowan with 11 teams of horses and mules to take the machinery and tools from the Salt Lake gun shop and the church pail factory uh, to Provo. Brigham Young settled some of his family on the Provo bench, now in Orem, before moving most of them to Provo. On April 22nd, Young selected a block east of the meeting house in Provo, where the Utah County Courthouse now stands as a storage and housing place. Workmen stacked up 18 loads of lumber to build the houses and sheds, which ended up as a large rectangular enclosure similar to the original units the Saints had built in what is now Pioneer Square in Salt Lake City. In May 1858, many of you of Young's families moved from temporary housing to settle there, as did the families of Fairmore's Little, Ephraim Hanks, and Charles Decker. The enclosure was en generally called Bowery Park or Bowery Row. The walls between each of the housing units were only six feet high, so residents of one shanty could hear everything that was said and done in the nearby enclosures. One observer thought it was as noisy as Bedlam, a no notorious London insane asylum. Uh, some of the families from Northern Utah settled northwest of Provo, about four miles north of a thousand acres that the settlers had set aside as the church pasture. Many of the saints camped as wards with their Northern Utah bishops. A number of them made brush and willow enclosures to, set, uh, to shelter themselves from the weather. Members of the Salt Lake 16th Ward camped near Bishop Frederick Kessler. Saints from the Cottonwood Ward made their camp near Bishop Milo Andrus. Mormons from the Bountiful Ward camped about a mile from Cottonwood Ward. Brigham Young was completely 
serious out about evacuating all of the settlements from Salt Lake City North. On May 10th, wagons, teams, and people transported themselves and their families on roads from Box Elder to Provo. As people pushed south from Brigham City, Willard, Ogden, Bountiful, and towns in between. After meeting with Brigham Young and church leaders in Salt Lake City on the 24th of April and attending services in the tabernacle and a, a prayer meeting on Sunday the 25th, Wilford Woodruff resumed taking loads to Provo on the 26th. He spent four days going to and from Provo with his three wagons. After recuperating at home in Salt Lake City two days, from May 2nd through 4th, he went to Tooele to have his sheep sheared. From May 5th through 9th, he loaded his three wagons and took them together with his wife, Phoebe, and her youngest child to Provo. He, Phoebe, and the, the wagons spent one night in Lehigh on the way. On the 9th, he returned to Salt Lake City, apparently leaving Phoebe and their child in Provo. Church and other work continued while the saints lived in Provo. On May 13th, Wilford Woodruff, George A. Smith, Albert Carrington, Lorenzo Snow, and others worked in the church historian's office in Provo in the seminary building. The office had been moved from the music hall to the seminary building by then. The saints tried to keep the roads in repair, but their efforts Lit, did little to improve the state road that was, of course, a dirt road at the time. By May 10th, wagon wheels had browned up and rutted the road between Salt Lake City and Provo so badly that Young uh, requested Hanson Walker and 50 men to repair it. We learn a great deal about Provo and both the usual inhabitants and the refugee saints living there from news reports sent on June 28th by New York Herald reporter Lemuel Fillmore. Fillmore wrote that before the move south, perhaps three or 4,000 people lived in Provo. The refugees from the north had swelled the city to six or 8,000. The original inhabitants lived in adobe brick houses. Evacuees from the north squatted throughout the city and on its western and northern borders. The saints from the nor northern towns lived in every conceivable type of dwelling. Many of them lived in wa wagon boxes. They unbolted the boxes from the axles and undercarriages and set them on the ground. They may, have, uh, may well have left the bows and bonnets in place for additional protection from the elements. Some lived in tents. Others, perhaps the poorest, occupied dwellings like Indians, thatched with straw. Some lived in dugouts just holes in the ground with brush piled on each side until it connected like a teepee at the top to form a roof. Some build wood shanties. Fillmore wrote that most of the dwellings were open and much exposed to the weather. Fillmore saw the refugee settlement in late June and surmised that, quote, it does not matter much at this season of the year but if the weather were cold, the people would suffer severely. Most families placed stoves in the open ground, uh, in the open air to cook their meals. Fillmore saw that the women suffered more than the men because while living in wagon boxes, shacks, tents, and dugouts, they still had to carry on ordinary household tasks, such as cooking meals, making butter and cheese, feeding and caring for domestic animals, and spinning cloth. Provo's regular residents and the evacuees from the north attended church meetings in the Bowery located at what is now Pioneer Park 
at Center Street and Fifth West. To accommodate the meetings, workmen had planted posts about 12 feet high with a roof covered with brush. Since the provolans had placed few benches in the Bowery, uh, most people carried their own chairs to the services. Fillmore attended both the morning and afternoon services on June 27th. In each meeting, he observed the congregation. He thought that the older women and men seemed quite contented while the children seemed distracted and the women from about ages 15 to 30 seemed unhappy. Fillmore's visit to Provo took place after a series of fortuitous events that brought an end to the move south and the return of the Northern Saints to their homes. On February 25th, 1858, Pennsylvania aristocrat Thomas L. Kane arrived in Salt Lake City from Southern California in the company of Elder Amasa Lyman of the Twelve. He had traveled by ship to the Atlantic coast of the Isthmus of Panama. He crossed the Panama and sailed from the Pacific side to California. Kane, who had befriended the Mormons in Illinois and Iowa, opposed President James Buchanan's decision to send the army to Utah. He met with Buchanan in December of 1857. After discussing his plans with the president, Kane left for Utah with Buchanan's tacit but unacknowledged approval. Kane carried three letters that Buchanan had written sanctioning his mission, but nevertheless, making it clear that the Pennsylvanian acted as an independent broker between Johnston and Cumming on the one hand and Young and the Latter-day Saints on the other. After meeting with Young and church leaders on March 8th, 1858, Kane traveled to Fort Scott with an es escort of Nauvoo Legion troops under the command of Colonel William Kimball to confer with General Johnston and Governor Cumming. Young had told Kane he would send supplies to the beleaguered army. Though the army needed the supplies, Johnston refused them, he said, assistance from rebellious Mormons. Against Johnston's vehement opposition, Kane convinced Cumming to accompany him to Salt Lake City. Greeted as governor by the Mormon militia and by those who remained in towns from Colville through Davis County all the way to Salt Lake City, Cumming and Kane arrived in the territorial capital on April 12, 1858. The church leadership recognized Cumming as governor as well, but in the case of some like Wilford Woodruff, quite reluctantly. On April 14, 13th, Kane approached Young and told him that he, Kane, quote, had caught the fish. Now you can cook it as you have a mind to. Young and George A. Smith met with Cumming at the Staines Mansion on South Temple. That's now called the Devereux House. While in Salt Lake City, Cumming investigated charges against the Latter-day Saints, including that they had destroyed records of the U.S. District Court. He found the records in good condition in the care of the court's clerk. He cleared, cleared up also some false charges of murder. On April 15th, Cumming wrote to Governor Johnston or to General Johnston explaining that he had been well treated and recognized as governor by the Mormons and that specific charges against the Mormons were false. On April 25th, Cumming gathered with general authorities and a congregation of saints in the tabernacle. He told them that the army had come to protect them from savages. And he, uh, that really went over big. And he offered security uh, to those Utahns who wanted to leave the territory. In spite of charges by some of the anti-Mormons that Young refused the dissidents the, the permission to leave, Young told Cumming, and the apostates who were in the meeting that he had no, no objection to their leaving Utah. After spending time in Salt Lake City, meeting with church leaders and other Latter-day Saints, Cumming and Cain traveled to Utah, then on May 4th, 1858, to Provo. While in Tooele, 
Cummings saw that the settlers had begun to evacuate the city and prepared to burn their homes if necessary to keep them from the army. He was astounded that they were moving to Provo and he was severely disappointed that he could not, quote, stop this moving and the burning of property. Cummings said that he must stop the burning somehow. On the way to Provo, the two of them met Brigham Young and others in Lehigh. The church leaders had gone back to Provo and were returning uh, to Salt Lake City. Instead of stopping in Provo, however, Cumming and Kane continued on to sp the Spanish Fork Indian Farm, which is on the boundary of Spanish Fork and Benjamin. At Cummings' request, uh, they met with Indian agent George W. Armstrong at the Indian Farm on May 5th. In spite of Cummings' efforts to dissuade the Mormons from moving, the move south continued. Because Johnston said at first that he planned to establish posts in Salt Lake City and Provo, on May 5th, the church moved the Deseret News printing plant to Fillmore. The newspaper remained in Fillmore and the staff printed it there until September 8th. Johnston eventually agreed to establish the army post that he named Camp Floyd in Utah County's Cedar Valley. In late May and early June 1858, Johnston's plans and the relationship between the Mormons and the United States government and the army changed radically to the saints' advantage. On June 7, 1858, Major Ben McCulloch, a former Texas Ranger and currently a U.S. Marshal, and Lazarus W. Powell, former Kentucky governor and now its senator-elect, arrived in Salt Lake City. They carried a document containing a blanket pardon from James Buchanan from the latter, or for the Latter-day Saints the two commissioners found a city virtually devoid of people, except about a thousand who remained to burn the buildings should the army stop there. On June 11th, Brigham Young and a large contingent of church leaders who had returned from Provo met with Powell, McCulloch, and Cumming. They agreed to hold a conference on June 12th. Young, George A. Smith, and others read the president's amnesty proclamation. The Latter-day Saints leaders tried without success to negotiate the terms of the agreement with the two commissioners. Powell and McCulloch, however, told them in no uncertain terms that they had no authority to negotiate. They did promise, however, that the army would not stop in Salt Lake City and that it would establish its base somewhere distant from the principal settlements. The commissioners made it clear that Buchanan had offered them a take it or leave it proposition. The church leaders had to accept or reject Buchanan's proclamation of pardon and total amnesty as it was written. After reading it and in a speech to those assembled, George A. Smith said, this proclamation contains 42 false charges. After hearing the commissioners, Brigham Young recognized that accepting the amnesty offered the Latter-day Saints the only way out of the dilemma in which they found themselves. They could reject it, burn their homes and buildings, remain in dugouts and shacks in Provo, and fight an unwinnable war with the army, or they could accept its terms. After weighing the alternatives and considering the promise that General Johnston and the army would not establish camp near any dense settlement, nor would he assign soldiers to the city, Young said, if a man comes from the moon and said he would pardon me for kicking him in the moon yesterday, I don't care about it. I'll accept of his pardon. It don't affect me one way or the other. After spending several days in Provo, Powell and McCulloch traveled, or in Salt Lake City, Powell and McCulloch traveled to Provo. 
On June 16th, Powell spoke in the Bowery in Provo to the local citizens and the refugees from the North. He acknowledged them as patriots, remarking that he, quote, had not heard a single expression of disloyalty. Young told the Latter-day Saint people to remain in Provo until he saw what the army did. On June 26, the army marched through a virtually abandoned and nearly silent Salt Lake City. The soldiers camped first beyond the Jordan before moving on to establish Camp Floyd in Western U Utah County. After he was certain that the army would not remain in Salt Lake City, he told the saints they could return to their homes in Northern Utah. On July 2nd, Provo streets were crowded with, quote, wagons, herds of cattle and flocks of sheep as people returned to their homes in the Northern settlements. Some 25 members of Young's family arrived in Salt Lake City on July 2nd. Now, what do we make of the new, the move south? Given Brigham Young's fear of armies, the fears experienced by other leaders and the statements from soldiers and confirming rumors that the soldiers intended to quote, exterminate the Mormons, his decision to evacuate Northern settlements seems reasonable. There were, however, a number of extremely negative features of the move south. First and foremost were the extraordinary expense and almost unbearable burdens the, Mormons, the Mormon people experienced. With the exception of few, a few guards left to burn the buildings if that proved necessary, the saints abandoned all of the settlements from Salt Lake City to Brigham City. Latter-day Saint leaders and lay members spent uncounted hours away from their homes, gardens, farms, and animals in extraordinarily substandard living conditions during the late spring and early summer of 1858. Had they remained in their hometowns instead of packing their families into tents, dugouts, and wagon boxes, they could have gone to bed in their own homes, plowed their fields, planted wheats and vegetables, pruned their fruit trees and bushes and cared for their animals. It is undoubtedly impossible to determine the cost of the move south, but it must have totaled in the millions of dollars. We must also consider the disruption of normal life, especially for Mormon women, cooking on stoves, churning butter, making cheese, spinning thread, and winning cloth in dirt yards, clearly subjected the women to incalculable physical and psychological stress. The move south to Provo was expensive, backbreaking, and stressful, but given the clear understanding that the soldiers plan to kill the Latter-day Saints. It was understandable. Thank you. Um, well, we can offer Tom a virtual uh, round of applause. There's um, a couple members of the Taylor family who are there giving him a little applause in person. Uh, thank you, Tom. Um, as you've been talking, we've had quite a few questions come in. And we have a few minutes to ask some of them. Um, I want to start with kind of a broad question about how these narratives uh, fit into kind of the more uh, familiar pioneer stories. As you were talking about, you know, them coming south and blizzards and sleeping in the mud underneath their wagons, like this all sounds very familiar. This sounds like a lot of the stories we get from the Overland Trek which are very, uh, a core part of Latter-day Saint heritage and, and, and kind of the historical narrative that Latter-day Saints have told. So I'm curious why these very similar narratives um, 
uh, haven't been kind of integrated into our stories? Why aren't these better known? Well, they ought to be. Uh, this was something that uh, was extremely important because of the fear of the army. I mean, they'd heard rumors and they knew about these statements by soldiers that they planned to kill them. Uh, that wasn't something that they had to fear on the Overland Trail. They had uh, left Nauvoo under pressure, uh, but in general, they were not bothered on the Overland Trail. Uh, they really uh, actually didn't have to fear the Indians. There were only about two Indian attacks on the whole uh, Overland movement of 70,000 uh, people. Uh, and they uh, tried to, uh, to move uh, with the exception of the Willie and Martin hand uh, cart companies during times uh, when they wouldn't have to, uh, to face uh, the elements. Uh, the trail uh, was uh, well known, the Overland Trail that followed the Platte route and uh, across South Pass. Uh, they knew where they were going. Uh, even in those years between 1856 and 1861, uh, when the hand carts uh, were uh, being used, most people still traveled by wagon. And uh, they didn't have to worry about making permanent settlements. Uh, they had to, uh, to worry about camping at night, uh, certainly while they were uh, traveling. Uh, but that's uh, different. Uh, from having to, uh, to spend uh, several months as they did from April through uh, June uh, living in those dugouts or living in wagon boxes. In, so in some ways you're arguing that some of the hardships they faced in this trek south were, in some ways, it was a shorter journey, but the context was perhaps more violent some of the conditions were actually well, worse. I think that uh, that they were extremely difficult uh, here in Provo. I mean, how would you like to live in a, ba a dugout with uh, limbs over the top and do all your cooking for three months outside? I mean, we might call it camping now, but uh, I don't think it would have been as fun then. <laughs> <laughs> um, did many of these exiles make commentary in their journals or in letters comparing this to their experiences on the Overland Trail? Uh, I don't remember seeing any of those comments, but there may have uh, been some. I know I went through all of Wilford Woodruff's uh, journal uh, for this, and he didn't compare it with the uh, Overland Trail. Um, we have a question from John Tanner. Um, uh, he says, hello and great job. Hi, um, John. <laughs> I'm sorry that you couldn't be there. How is your wife? <laughs> Uh, John uh, is uh, the part of the family who helps, uh, for, for those watching, helps uh, fund some of these awards in this lecture. But at oh, last well, minute, there was a question. He wasn't able to come in. Um, do you want to know what, what do we know about the effect on agricultural production for 1858? He says, one of my grandmothers who moved south said that when she returned to her home in Bountiful, that it looked like they'd been away for a year. But I don't know if her ha family had much of a harvest that year. Uh, the uh, harvests were very uh, spare, uh, sparse uh, that year because there wasn't anybody there to take care of crops that had been planted be uh, before they left. And uh, in uh, this region, you had to irrigate for them. Who, who would do the irrigating? Uh, some of them came back to Salt Lake City. I know we have uh, reports of uh, fruit trees that had died because they weren't uh, uh, watered. Uh, in uh, some places, they couldn't uh, plant their crops. And uh, uh, having been away for a year sounds probably reasonable uh, for many of these people in the settlements to the north. Um, we have a whole bunch of questions around uh, kind of a, a similar theme um, about what was the population levels here in the Utah Valley uh, in comparison to how many people came down from Salt Lake? And then how is the reception here of those who are already living here? Was, okay. What was the difference uh, in population? I don't know the population of the whole valley, but the population of Provo was about five or 6,000. Uh, uh, it was swelled uh, to somewhere, uh, or excuse me, four or 5,000. It was swelled somewhere between uh, six to 8,000 by the people coming here 
but there were people also who settled in uh, Lehigh, uh, in American Fork, in Pleasant Grove, and then uh, further south in uh, Spanish Fork and, and uh, Springville. So it was not an insignificant influx. It was, no, it was. was uh, and uh, for instance, they didn't think there was room uh, to uh, have the Deseret News in this settlement. So they moved it all the way to Fillmore. And there were some people who actually did go further south, some as far south as Parowan uh, in, uh, to establish a settlement. Um, a few people, um, Logan Millsap, Gary and Elizabeth Smith, and uh, one other person asked a, a related question. Logan says, Utah Valley is obviously superior to Salt Lake Valley, so why would anyone <laughs> move back? Um, which is a good joke. Um, and I live down here, so maybe I agree. I don't know. But um, a few people asked a similar question. How many of these exiles ended up staying here in Utah Valley or Parowan or other places instead of going back north? Uh, there were some. I've read the, uh, the journal of a man who moved from Salt Lake City uh, to uh, Spanish Fork, and he was so impressed uh, with how uh, great the fishing was there. Uh, th there's a lot of fishing that goes on in uh, Utah Valley. There was particularly a lot in uh, Utah Lake. Uh, that he decided to uh, settle there, and he was able to get enough uh, land uh, to have a farm. And I think that uh, his uh, experience uh, probably was not unusual. I think there were some who decided to uh, remain here uh, rather going back than going back to uh, Northern Utah. And uh, at that time, Provo was the second largest city in, uh, in the territory. Uh, later Ogden became uh, larger and then now Provo has uh, surpassed uh, Ogden, but uh, uh, this, this was a place that uh, some of the people who moved down here liked and uh, decided to remain. I wonder if a real fine tooth comb uh, analysis of that would reveal uh, economic differences, perhaps those who weren't as well established up north or didn't have as big of land holdings or agricultural things established were more likely perhaps to remain south. But that may be the case. Yeah. I, I really don't know. Uh, I've just looked at a, a few diaries and I have not looked at the uh, statistics. I'm not sure how you get those. Uh, the most recent uh, census was taken in 1850 and then there would be another one in uh, 1860. So everything would have been an estimate. Yeah, um, we have another, um, not a question, but a hello from Carolyn Taylor, who says, uh, hello, she says, I've, I've known Tom my entire life. Who is um, this? Uh, Carolyn Taylor. Oh, Carolyn Warner oh, Taylor Carolyn. Says, says hello. <laughs> um, I yeah, was going to uh, ask. I was going to ask this, and then someone else asked it as well about why Brigham Young was so fearful about the U.S. Army coming into Salt Lake Valley, and why he viewed Utah Valley as more, as significantly more safe. And I thought initially of um, the Utah Guard quarters uh, above Nuns Park in Provo, which were established during this time to. To, to monitor, and the, the ruins are still up there in Provo Canyon. So there was some concern of Provo Canyon, but um, why were they so certain that this would be so much safer? Well, actually Provo Canyon was not a particularly good route until after this move south. Uh, uh, right near the end of it, uh, Brigham Young uh, sent uh, surveyors uh, to uh, survey the canyon so they could build a road through it. And uh, they built, uh, a road uh, shortly after that uh, from Provo up to Hebrew City. So you could come in that way. Uh, people by that time were not coming in by Emigration Canyon. They were coming down uh, Weber Canyon. Uh, that's uh, how uh, Coming and Kane went and uh, came back to, uh, uh, to Salt Lake City. So they went through uh, the uh, settlements in Davis County. Uh, and uh, after he got uh, the promise that the army would not establish settlement or, or uh, posts in Salt Lake City and in Provo and that they would move somewhere away from the uh, larger settlements, 
uh, he felt okay about that. But uh, what they were trying to do was to get the uh, army away, uh, get themselves away from the army. Yeah. And uh, they knew they would have to evacuate the northern settlements to do that. Um, Eric Rasmussen, um, who actually is our board member from the Red uh, Family Foundation at the moment, yeah, um, know, asks, um, how did the move south influence later calls by Brigham Young for saints to settle more distant and desolate parts of Utah, having left, left their homes in disrepair, becoming accustomed to being sent to a relative wilderness by leadership? Did calls to settle far away follow on closely, or what movement, or was that movement unrelated to the Utah war and the move south? Uh, I don't know that it was particularly related to it. Uh, distant settlements had already begun by that time. Uh, settlers had already moved to Parowan and uh, Cedar City. Uh, some had uh, begun to uh, settle in Washington County. Um, some of the more distant uh, settlements didn't take place until uh, after that. Those in uh, Arizona and in uh, Western Colorado, but uh, he'd sent a settlement to Southern California already. They'd established San Ber uh, Bernardino. Uh, there were uh, settlements in uh, Western Nevada in the Carson uh, Valley area. Uh, those were called in and the missionaries were uh, called in at uh, that time. But I don't think that uh, th there was a connection between the move south and the establishment of uh, more distant settlements. So maybe it's part of just a kind of a continuum. There's there's a lot of people being, uh, you know, sent out moving to new settlements. Uh, there's a lot of mobility throughout this whole period. It sounds like there were um, in the 1850s, yes, yeah. and afterward. Um, Bill McKinnon um, asks uh, a, a, a challenging question. He says. Um, please comment on the notion of equality of sacrifice. Did the Latter-day Saints seem to comment on the fact that leaders lived in relative comfort while saints not in leadership positions and their families were left to live in the elements? Did they realize that Brigham Young staff in Salt Lake were making near daily shipments of spring fruits and vegetables to him in Provo? Was there a, an awareness or a commentary on inequality of the sacrifice people were facing? Uh, I didn't. Uh, find a, a commentary on it, but uh, Bill is right. The uh, leaders did live better in Provo than uh, most of the common members. Uh, most of them were uh, living in camps uh, with their uh, bishops. Uh, Brigham Young had that uh, Bowery Row uh, place, and the others were able to, uh, to live uh, in uh, some of the houses of uh, people in Provo. Uh, but I didn't find, well, Bill may know about this. He knows a whole lot about uh, more about this than uh, I do. Uh, Bill, did you find uh, comments from uh, others uh, about the uh, difference in the living standards of uh, the church leaders and the regular members? Let me see if, um, I don't, Bill, I don't know if you're able to talk. I'll, uh, Click your mic on if you if you want to respond. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Hi, Th Tom. Thank you for doing this lecture. Uh, good job. I really enjoyed it. Uh, thank you. I'm I'm just two weeks off of having had a heart valve replacement, but I was oh. absolutely determined that one of the things in my recovery that I was going to do was hear your talk. So here here we are. Um, I, f I found remarkably little commentary <clears throat> about the inequality of sacrifice, which was kind of amazing because even though technically the move south took place in the spring, it was in winter weather. It was really severe, especially in early April. Yeah, well, so uh, Wilford Woodruff commented on that. W uh, he was moving in, in what he said was the worst snowstorm of the whole winter. Yeah, I mean, so, so the Latter-day Saints were exposed to winter weather during the, that terrible spring. Relatively few commented though about the fact that their leaders had commandeered private homes, all the hotels in Provo and that wagon load after wagon load of lumber was shipped from the Salt Lake Valley 
to Provo to build the Bowery Row. I mean, yeah. I, I, I was surprised that there was so little commentary on it. And when you read the office diaries of Brigham Young secretaries and clerks like Brother Kane and, and others, I mean, they were preoccupied with making sure the Youngs had a shipment of strawberries that day and asparagus a little later. Contrary to that, Albert Oh, I, sorry, I think I muted, uh, muted. Yeah, I'm thing. sorry. Um, Bill, can you, um, there, sorry, go ahead. We can hear you now, sorry about that. Contrary to the lack of comment and latter day sources about inequality of sacrifice, the army troops commented at a great length uh, in a positive way in the sense that they noted that during that terrible march to Fort Bridger in November of 1857, that Albert Sidney Johnson got off his horse and limped in the snow with them the last 15 or, or 20 miles. Johnson had been wounded in a, in a duel during the Texas Revolution, so he had a, a bad, and he gave up his horse and he marched in the snow with the infantrymen and, and he drew no more rations than they did. Uh, his troops were well aware of the issue of equality of sacrifice and it was part of Johnston's personal leadership style that he behaved that way. I, you can you can tell the sun goes one way or the other, but there there was one demonstration of equality of sacrifice among the army in November of 1857. There was another demonstration of whether that concept did or didn't hold in March and April of 1858 in the group that the army opposed. I just make one other comment, and that is that. Tom has very well limed the impact of inflammatory rhetoric in the on the Latter Day Saints, uh, especially people in General Harney. Uh, you know, we're talking about hanging the twelve apostles and uh, things of that sort. Uh, uh, the, the army created a problem for itself by out of control inflammatory rhetoric, just as I believe. Brigham Young created a problem for himself earlier with the comments he made about the federal government and uh, and and others. Uh, so rhetoric on both sides created problems that aggravated this conflict. But clearly, the con the rhetoric that came out of the army was a decisive factor. That Brigham Young had a a an understandable and morbid fear being lynched or summarily executed as he was well aware his predecessor had been uh well enough of that yeah uh, thank, Tom, you. Thank, thank you thank you Bill. thank you again Thanks, for doing Bill. this time um uh, perhaps uh, we're, we're probably already well over time but one last question here and there and thank you for everyone for sending so many questions and we have not been able to get to uh, a fraction of them um uh, Lynn Henriksen says that she heard you mention Brigham City um, and some others in the north, but on the front, um, and asks, what about saints in Cache Valley? Um, did they evacuate and move south also, or other kind of northern settlements that weren't in that direct path of where the army would be coming through? I haven't found any evidence that the Cache Valley settlements did. Uh, that uh, settlement had just been established in 1856. Uh, the uh, Mon and the settlers did move out and did not go back again until 1858, 59. Uh, but I didn't find evidence that uh, their leaving uh, Cache Valley had anything to do with the uh, Utah War. It had to do with battles that they were having with the Shoshone. Uh, uh, they simply could not sustain themselves in, uh, in uh, Cache Valley against uh, the uh, uh, Shoshone with those small settlements at uh, Wellsville. Uh, well, thank you, Tom. Thank you to everyone who attended. Um, we uh, hope to we'll return again in the fall with more um, lectures like this. I'm actually coming up on May 22nd. We're going to be co-hosting uh, a small conference by the Hole in the Rock Foundation. You can go to our websites and find information about that there. But 
We'll be back in the fall live streaming um, some more of our events. Hopefully there'll be true public in-person events that are also live streamed. And, um, but we're really grateful that Tom uh, has helped us kind of get back into the swing of things uh, this semester. So thank you very much, Tom. We appreciate your willingness to do this and, and your great scholarship as well. Thank you. All right, take care, everyone. Uh, Tanner, thank you for coming. <laughs>